I know when we look around, it is easy to uh, become disheartened by all the things that we see with the shootings of the synagogue and the other crimes that are going around. But we know that we live in the last days, and we know that Christ is coming back. And so I want you as children of God to take heart because things are not falling apart. Things are falling into place. It take solace in the fact that we knew these things were coming from the old times and prophecy is being fulfilled around us. Amen. Today I want you to turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. We're going to get right into the scripture today. As you're looking at that, uh, I do see the shoe boxes. I know this is our kickoff for Operation Christmas Child. It's a wonderful thing to be back at Ephesus Baptist Church. I enjoy coming here so much. And the, uh, the write-up was, uh, I had a few, uh, few wonderful little punctuations on the way up. I stopped. I, I always say I'm going to do this, but I always feel like I'm in a rush or I don't have time today. I had time. And I stopped in Jamaica and took a picture of the sign and then posted it on Facebook to let everybody know that I was driving to the islands today. <laughs> um, it wasn't more than a mile, mile and a half after I did that, got back on the road. Two bald eagles came towards the car and one, there was probably, I don't know, 15 foot deep ditch right, right beside the car. And one was coming down towards that and the other one was getting kind of waved off because he was smaller and wasn't going to get whatever was down there to get. But the eagle came with talons outstretched and the, and the wings kind of slowing it down, almost stopping in midair within about 10 feet of my windshield. And it was just a magnificent sight. So I had that to look at. And then just to see the progression of the leaves, because we're still green in South, in, uh, down in uh, uh, Virginia Beach. And as we get further and further, you see the ambers and the, and the, the rubies and things coming out in, in the leaves. And just to see nature and how God kind of paints with his brush the different colors, the different watercolors across our scenery. It's very enheartening to see all that happening. So it was a good trip up. Uh, I wanted to, to tell you about that. I wanted to just mention very quickly the shoe boxes. I feel like everybody knows how to pack a shoe box, what goes in. I did see on the website this year, they're going back to letting people wrap them with uh, uh, Christmas paper if you care to. Be very ca careful about that. You know, you got some Muslim countries out there, so you don't want pictures of the image of Christ as much as we want to share Christ. Uh, it's up to the packers to make sure that the right kind of wrapping goes to the right country. Uh, some terrible things have happened. Uh, some children have been caught with pencils that had an American flag on it. You don't even think about it. When you're using a Ticonderoga pencil, you don't even see the American flag, but it's there. And terrible things have happened to some of these children. So we just need to protect them. It's not, a, it's not an issue of being afraid to, to uh, share the gospel at all. It's a thing of we need to make sure that we are actually ministering to and not doing harm to the people that we're reaching out to. Uh, and I saw that we're, we're, they're letting us wrap things, and I think that's important. I have heard stories, personal testimonies of children who have received these packages and they'll take that wrapping paper off very carefully and use the white side of it to do their homework. So I thought that was, that was uh, quite, a, quite a story there. I want to give one quick story. I was, in, um, I was down in, uh, uh, Atlanta, near Atlanta uh, at um, a conference, and I'm not, Catalyst, down at Catalyst, and a lady came and she was uh, in her early 20s and her name was something like Maritza, or Maritza, something like that. I want to say it was Maritza. She came and she started talking about her experience with Operation Christmas Child. And it's a rather long story, but the short version was this, that as she would walk to school, she had a pair of white lace-up Convert tennis shoes she had, that had been handed down to her from a couple of her other older siblings. And the outer edge, the threads had rotted through, and so it looked like every time she stepped into the slush or the snow that the, to the shoes were opening like mouths. And so her mother would take plastic bags, wrap her feet with the plastic bags, tie a piece of twine around her ankle. She'd put the shoe on with the plastic bag inside so she could walk to school without getting her feet wet. And she called these shoes her hungry shoes because it looked like they were continually eating snow as she walked through the, through the slush and the snow to school. And she says one day she's going to school and completely unannounced, here are children coming back home from school and they have these red boxes and they're balancing them on their head. Not so much as to, uh, they couldn't carry them, but if they were up high, if somebody tried to steal them, somebody would be able to see it and, it, and they'd be able to track them down. 
So they had these children coming out of the school with the shoe boxes on their head and said, what is this? They explained the thing about uh, Operation Christmas Child. She got her shoe box and she said, God, I have been praying for shoes that are not hungry for so long. Is there any chance I've got them? And she opens her box and sure enough, a pair of black shiny leather shoes or in their size eight, the exact size she wore. And she said she was so excited about this when she got them home. Uh, there's a hundred stories that we could share um, the, uh, about the, the miracles that have happened through Shoebox, but I just encourage you, go ahead, take advantage of it, uh, participate. Uh, I understand you no longer have uh, a goal. There, you don't set a goal anymore. And I think that's, that's kind of a good thing. I am interested. Are you still donating more than Mount Zion? Of course, okay, all right. Well, that's the important thing. That's the important thing. Let's get into our scripture right away. It's 1 Corinthians chapter 15. We're going to go almost to the end of the chapter, starting with verse 42. So also is the resurrection of the dead. The body is sown in corruption. It is raised in incorruption. It is sown in dishonor. It is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness. It is raised in power. It is sown a natural body. It is raised a spiritual body. There is a natural body and there is a spiritual body. And so it is written, the first Adam became a living being. The last Adam became a life giving spirit. Let me read that last line again. The last Adam became a life giving spirit. Now we read scripture and you read scripture as it is intended. You read poetry as if it's a poem, you read history as if it's history. You read the, uh, the epistles as if they are letters. You read uh, the gospels as if it is your narrative of the, of the Bible, understanding it is written in a way to be understood. This section, uh, Paul, our, probably our best educated author in the scripture, has written for us pretty much a, a, a theological dissertation and has distilled it down into such everyday language that anybody can understand. We have our first Adam, creation. Eve's husband, Garden of Eden, when everything was perfect. And he only had a couple of rules to follow, right? But still, he was our first Adam, brought out of the dirt, out of the dust, given a wife. And then, centuries later, we have Christ. And Paul says, and Christ is the type of a second Adam. You had a birth, but you can have a rebirth. You had a creation, but now your soul can be recreated. And he sets out a dichotomy that then he and we interweaves with each other, knowing this, that the first Adam, and if you take notes, I'm going to make it easy on you. The first Adam had a will, a work, and a love. The second Adam, Christ himself, has a will, a work, and a love. And then we, being formed in the image of God, have a will, a work, and a love. So if you're taking notes, that's how easy it is. We are made in the image of God. We're made in the image of God like this. We are three parts, body, soul, and spirit. God himself is a trichotomy. It's God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. After that, there are many differences between us and the divine. He is divine. We are made in natural form. He is other, and we are normal. He is superior, and we are inferior. And we could go on and on. But Paul lays it out with these terms that are kind of a juxtaposed, kind of oxymoronic, laying out there saying, this is who the first Adam was. This is who the sec second Adam is. Let's continue now with this uh, theological uh, distillation that, that Paul has for us with verse 46. However, so now he's going to turn the tables a little bit. However, the spiritual is not but the natural, and after the spiritual. The first man was of the earth, made of dust. The second man is the Lord. That word Lord is the word Adonai, meaning our, our authority, the one we answer to. The authority, the Lord, from heaven. He was the man of, he was the man of dust, and so are those who are made of dust. And as it is the heavenly man, so also those who are heavenly. And as we have borne the image of man of dust, we shall also bear the image of the heavenly man. Now, 
Don't get lost in these statements back and forth because it's easy to get confused. But understand this, there are some things that we understand with our earthly understanding, other things we understand with a spiritual understanding. Paul addresses this. You don't have to turn back here, but in your own time, you can go back about a dozen chapters to 1 Corinthians uh, 2.14 where it says, the man without the spirit does not access those things that come from the spirit of God. They are foolishness to him, and he cannot understand them because they are spiritually discerned. So we have our first Adam. He has a will to obey. Only a couple of laws, right, that we have for him to obey. you got to remember, they didn't have a whole lot of, of, of rules and regulations back then. You don't have jails and prisons. You don't have lawyers and judges. You don't have the sheriff and the police. It's a very simple society to live in. God says, I've just got a couple of rules for you. You can eat anywhere you want, but here is this tree, this tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Stay away. That's it. Beyond that, there is the tree of life. That's my jurisdiction. I'll let you know when that's open to you. And so they go through their life in Eden, and we know the story. We don't have to break it all down. But we know that as they're there for a while, they begin tilling a garden. They begin husbanding animals. They, things begin to prosper for them. And then the serpent comes along and tricks Eve and says, Eve, over here, this fruit tree, just eat a little of it. Here in Western society, we say it was an apple. Do you know that in European society, they say it was a quince? How many of you have ever eaten a quince? One? All right. We are a two. We are a quince-free society. That's all there is to it. But we, Eve eats that, and for, of course, that is the first time Adam coins the phrase. He looks at Eve and says, you have now eaten us out of house and home. That's not in the Bible. So he's, she, eats, she eats the fruit, and she says, Adam, here, you have some. And he does, and they disobey. They disobey. And in my opinion, that disobedience is the knowledge of good and evil. All of a sudden, they know what it is to sin. They know what it is to go against the will of God. They have a will to obey, and now they have broken their own covenant, their own will, their own intentions. And now they have crossed that line, and they know what it is to dis disobey God. Now think for a minute. He says, right after that, he sa God says, I had now placed angels with fiery swords around the tree of life, lest you eat of it. And in my Bible, there's a hyphen. Now, a hyphen in Scripture is a literary device that lets us know that the answer to what's ever just been stated is either too wonderful that words can't reach it or too horrible to really be written down. And I think it's the last one. It is too horrible to be written down. What would happen if we as fragile, simple human beings who now had a will to disobey, a will to sin, knowledge of death, and yet we could circumvent the cross and not worry about eternal life through submitting to God, but instead get a hold of that tree of life. And now we have eternal life and no need of God. How horrible would society fall? We have a will and we have a work. And that work then was to tend the garden. Prior to the fall, we're told that Adam and Eve, they kept the garden. It was their keep. It was their responsibility. It's what they did. After it says, and you will, you will uh, work it by the sweat of your brow. This is not going to be easy. This is going to be labor. In fact, over in Genesis chapter 319, it says, by the sweat of your brow, will you eat the food until I return, till you return to the ground, since from it you were taken. For dust you have come, and to dust you will return." Beyond that, he says, despite the fact that I know you're going to mess up, I'm going to give you the greatest gift of all. I'm going to give you a woman. Now, men, if you're not married, you don't have to, 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 to answer this. But men, do you agree that the greatest gift you have ever had is your wife? Amen? I believe you can't, you can't get... Be Okay, those of you who didn't say amen, <laughs> which were many, <laughs> you, you'll be eating at Lowry's by yourself this afternoon. <laughs> wow. 
given as a helpmeet, as an equal, as somebody who helped them through this, these stages in life, not as subservient, not as anything else, but somebody there to walk beside them through this garden, through this life, to see success. Now think about the, the outcome of this. God knew, being omniscient, being omnipotent, he knows from the very beginning, humankind is going to fail him. He knows that humankind is going to go ahead and grab hold of that tree of the knowledge of good and evil. He knows more and expects less out of us than we expect out of ourselves, and yet he blesses us with some of the most fantastic gifts that he could ever give. Amen. The first one being a helpmeet, a husband, a wife, somebody to have companionship with. He gives us this love. The same thing happens when Christ, when the second Adam comes along, he has a work to do. Philippians 2, 8 says this, And being found in the fashion of man, he humbled himself and became obedient to death, even to the death of the cross. Wow. I don't know how to really express how profound that is. I imagine that from a very young age, probably since the time he could actually uh, communicate, Jesus understood that there was a death waiting for him that was more cruel and more uh, barbaric than anything anybody who knew had experienced. And yet he continued to live out this perfect life so that one day his work would be fulfilled, so he could take on himself the sins of the world because only the perfect Son of God, only the Lamb of God could do this. I can't imagine what it would be like to have your flesh pierced with spikes. I can't imagine what it would be like to be stripped naked and hung up on a pole. You know, when we, ha when we have images of Christ, we're the ones that put the loincloths or diapers or cloths or whatever around him. That didn't happen at the crucifixion. To be humiliated like that. Do we ever think that Christ would have not had to take care of the call of nature when he's strung up there for three days? How humiliating would that be? How embarrassing Yet knowing that that was going to be his ultimate sacrifice, he still worked for us. He still took three and a half years out of his life in order to disciple, in order to not just make a new religion, but to start a new movement that would transform hearts, moving us from the, from the former version where we had of Judaism of all this information and obedience to transformation and obedience out of our simple respect for who he was and what he would do for us. Because of this, his work was successful. He had a will. He had a will to obey God. He came to earth emptying himself of his Godhead. He came to earth knowing that when he got here, he would have all of these all these people that would fight against him. Understand, if we were alive in his day, the, the, uh, uh, the Pharisees, the ones who were strict about Scripture, who read it every day, who were as obedient, as obedient as they could be, who then even actually wrote new rules because they were afraid that the old rules weren't quite strict enough, those would be the people we would hang out with. We may, may not want to really admit that, but those would be our kind of folks. They love the Word of God, so do we. They are adherent to all the rules, so are we. And they're all about ritual, but the difference was they're about ritual over relationship. That's where we differ. We are more about the relationship we have with Christ. Why? Because he took out of his life that time to be sacrificed. He took the 12, he discipled them, he brought about this great movement, this great revolution of the faith. He then uh, left here through his, through his death, burial, and resurrection. He comes back, the Holy Spirit then comes in his stead, ministers to us, works through us, and dwells us so that we can then be about the work that we are left to do. He has a work to do. He has a will, and he has a great love. The same way that God gives Adam a bride... God gives Christ a bride, the church. He gives us as his bride so that he can lavish his love on us and we can then lavish our love on him. And the same way that God knew that Adam was going to mess up and yet still blessed him, the same way that Jesus knew on the cross 
that we were going to mess up and really, really never deserve the gifts he, were, he was giving us. And yet he still lavished his love on us by loving us so that we could then come back and love on him too. It is that relationship that we have, that inner peace that we enjoy and enjoying with each other because of where we are, what our relationship is with Christ himself. He had his work, he had his will, and he had his love, and that's you and I. The same thing could be said of you and I. We have our own work to do, and we have our own will. We're told here that we're born to the image of Adam, born again of the image of Jesus, and we have this will, work, and love. We have this will to do, this work to do, this wonderful love that Christ gave him, which is himself. If we go to John chapter 21, verse 17, he talks about our obedience. He said unto him the third time, speaking to Peter, Simon, son of Jonah, lovest thou me? Peter was grieved because he said unto him the third time, lovest thou me? And he said unto him, Lord, thou knowest all things. Thou knowest that I love thee. And Jesus, Jesus saith unto him, Then feed my sheep. Are you feeding his sheep? Because that's the, the uh, measure that Christ is using for Peter. Do you really love me? If you really, if you really love me, what are you doing with that love? Are you feeding my sheep? Now, there's a lot of ways we could feed sheep, right? Maybe, maybe you're the teacher of the fifth grade boys Sunday school class. And if you are, God bless you. That's a very difficult uh, group to, to, uh, to teach, but, but they're, they're worth it. I was a fifth grader, and I gave my Sunday school teacher all kinds of grief. But if that's your calling, then that's your feeding the sheep of God. You are ministering to them. If you're a Sunday school teacher of any grade, you are feeding the sheep of God. If you have a Bible study during the week or something going on at your home where you're opening up the Word of God and you're helping others dig in and find out how this affects their life and what they're to do with this, you're feeding the sheep of God. If you have other ministries that you're doing, you're feeding the sheep of God. Brother Larry, Pastor Larry, good friend of mine, I want to tell you, I'm sure you know how fortunate you are to have such a godly man. To, to lead you, to guide you, to, to teach you every Sunday morning. And when he does it, he doesn't just come up here, flip open the Bible, point his finger at an unfamiliar verse and start talking. He spent time digging into the Word to try to find out what did this mean, what does this mean, and how can we apply this to our lives today. He's a great speaker. I hope you appreciate that about him. But when he does that, he is feeding the sheep. Now, each of us, it is my, my conviction that each of us need to find a ministry that we are uh, able to do. Something that attracts us, something that we enjoy, using our gifts, our abilities, our talents. And sometimes you want to say, well, how do I know what I'm really good at? If you don't know, ask somebody. And ask somebody who will be honest with you. And just say, what do you see as my gifts? What do you see as my talents? Where could I fit into the body of Christ? And who would I most benefit. Ask them and let them give you feedback. Find yourself a ministry that you can do. And this is really, in my opinion, this is what maturing in the faith is all about. We mature in faith when we find somebody else and we disciple them on what we're doing. The same way that Christ had 12 disciples, we should have at least one, maybe more. And you start off taking them through and you say, I'm going to do this ministry, you watch. And then you say, okay, now I'm going to do the same ministry, you come help. Now I'm going to do the same ministry, you're going to, to actually lead and I'm going to help you. And finally, you're going to do that ministry and I'm going to watch. And when they get to that point that they're capable of doing it without you, you move on. And you find somebody else to disciple. Because now they have come to the point of maturity in their faith that they can now disciple someone else. If you're in business, you've probably uh, come across something called the uh, competency square. Maybe, maybe not. But it goes to uh, unconsciously incompetent, consciously incompetent, unconsciously competent, consciously competent. In other words, I don't know what I don't know. Now I know what I don't know. Now I don't know just how much I really do know. Now I know what I know and I'm able to do it. 
and you then get to the back to the first corner and you start taking other people through it and you grow your business like that. It's the same way when you can grow your ministry. Every ministry should be growing and you do it through devices like that. You disciple others and in discipling others, you're then able to move on and grow and do great things for God. That's part of what our work is. We have a will, we have a work, and we have a love. Our love is Christ himself. Now, maybe your ministry is something like the youth ministry, or maybe your ministry is the shoebox ministry, because that's one of the ministries we can all do. There are those that have retired from God and simply say, I've done my, my stint in the nursery and in Sunday school, and I really, I just, time for me to sit back and watch others. No, it's probably time for you to disciple others because you have that much experience. But here's something that anybody can do, and it's these shoeboxes. Another story that I came across is a lady who had gone to the Philippines. And some of you uh, include a picture of yourself or your family in the shoebox. Not everybody does. This lady had included a picture of herself and her family in her shoebox and had sent it on three years earlier. She then decides that the next year she's going to go down to Charlotte and she's going to pack shoeboxes. She then decides the next year she's going to actually fly out with wherever she needed to go in the world and help distribute shoeboxes. And she gets to the Philippines and she's handing out boxes and here comes this girl in her early teens, grabs her by the hand and says, come to my house. She can barely speak English, says, come to my house, come to my house. So they, she goes down the street, gets to her house just a few blocks away, opens the door and here is this woman's picture stuck up to the wall of this girl's bedroom. She said, every day I pray for you and I thank God that you sent me shoeboxes. And the connection that happened right there. And to know that when we send these things out, they've got a gospel tracked in. They have a version of the Bible in there in every, every nation that will allow us to do it. There's a version of the Bible in there in their language that they can read. And usually it's a children's version of that Bible so that the salvation message can then be brought all around the world. Pastor Larry told me that you guys have kind of shifted gears a little bit where every ministry you do needs to be an outreach gospel type of ministry. If you do nothing else, you can do this. Where is it that you can get involved? Where is it you can then show love to this world where you can feed God's sheep? Because they're not just here at Ephesus. You know that. They're not just in Tappahannock or in Essex County. They're all the way around the world. And now I ask you, will you feed a sheep? We have a work to do, and we have a people to love, and that is this world around us. God so loved Ephesus that he gave his only son. God so loved Essex. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. And so here we are with our chance to feed them spiritually by being the light in the darkness. Fanny Crosby wrote a song, and I'm not going to read the whole thing. I'll just read the verses to you because it's kind of a long song. But it's called To the Work. To the work, to the work, we are servants of God. Let us follow the path that our master has trod. With the balm of his counsel, our strength to renew. Let us do with our might what our hands find to do. To the work, to the work, let the hungry be fed. To the fountains of life, let the weary be led. In the cross and its banner, our glory shall be. While we herald the tidings, salvation is free. To the work, to the work, there is labor for all. For the kingdom of darkness and air shall fall. And the love of our Father exalted shall be. In the loud swelling chorus, salvation is free. To the work, to the work, in the strength of the Lord. And a robe and a crown shall be our reward. Then the home that is faithful and dwelling shall be, as we shout with the ransom, salvation is free. Toiling on, toiling on, let us hope and trust, let us watch and pray, and labor until our master comes. We have this wonderful love, and that is the love we have for the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, because we know they are loving on us daily, pouring out their blessings, their counsel, their presence on us, and we in turn Pour out our love on them. Join me in prayer, please. And now, God, our Father, we thank you. We thank you for being the one who cares for us, who leads us, who speaks to our very heart. 
We ask, Father, that as we go about through this day, through this week, that we might understand more deeply what it is to love you, to work for you, and to with you. Father, we know that you are our great counselor. You are our salvation. You are our Adonai, our Lord, our authority. And so, Father, we give you our will. We give you our work. We give you our love. And we do this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. What is, number is our hymn? 444. If you would stand, please, and join me in singing hymn number 444. Oh, please. Our school here does shoeboxes the week of November the 12th. Me and Debbie have helped the children a few years. But last year, there wasn't enough things to put in the shoeboxes. You don't know what goes in the shoebox. We need paper, coloring books, pencils, no American flags on them, <laughs> small toys. If last year we did not have enough toys. Each one of these children loved to come and pack a shoebox. We also would like to put in uh, wash rags, soap, things that... Um, a little girl would like a comb. She would like a hair bow. A boy would like a pair of socks. If God tells you to put a pair of shoes in a box, no, like this story, somewhere God has a child that needs a pair of shoes. This is a very important ministry, and Larry would stress it that you can't do missions. <coughs> Brandy's going to. But we can do missions through this project that God will use and you will see the reward in eternity. So anyone. Please join me in prayer. And now to the God omnipotent, all powerful, all knowing, we give you all the love, honor, and joy that you deserve. We ask, Father, that as we live out this truth this week, that we might understand the will, the work, and the love that we have. Father, let us be light in this dark world. Let us be salt in this tasteless society. We ask, Father, now, for your blessings on us all as we leave here today to live out your will in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for coming. Go in peace.